Okay, so good morning, everyone. I hope you've been enjoying your time at learning at Monkey Fest so far, learning a lot of new summer and stuff so far with the recent <laughs> sessions that have already happened yesterday and today. Today, we're going to be looking at quite a topic. So it's going to be developing IoT within the Samarin and uh, Azure environment. So firstly, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Ronaldi Gunus Broto, and I am the CEO of Gris Studio. So, and also, if after the conference, if you have any questions, you can ask me when I'm, for example, in the hallway, or you can also reach me out on Instagram. I don't use Twitter, so I use Instagram. It's written over there, at Ronaldi Gunus Broto. You can just direct message me and ask me something about what you want to know. So, a, a bit about myself first. I actually started to get into IoT when because I was interested in what the developments had within the internet for many of the devices. Eventually, I stumbled upon Samarin. I used to use uh, particularly monitoring services, for example, like monitoring uh, pollutants in the air, but eventually I started to, uh, usually it's done manually, and I eventually started to do it like with an IoT-based service, but eventually I stumbled upon Samarin, and I started to think, what if we can actually start to get some of the data that way through Samarin, because it offers a lot of potential in doing cross-mobile apps. Can we just integrate everything into one that way, and can we just, find more potential within IoT? Where can we connect more devices and simplify things when necessary? That's where I ca came into the Samarin world and eventually I started to also make use of the Azure environment to be able to get the data in and store the data there as the cloud. And that's a bit about the background of where I came in when Samarin was introduced. And so I'm gonna be talking a bit about uh, those stuff and also about how you can do it too. And this talk is going to be based on 100% on real-world applications because that's what I believe that IoT is all about. A lot of I'm sure a lot of you have already heard about IoT, and today I'm so I'm today I'm just going to go directly into the real-world applications that are available. So why should you care about IoT? Now I'm sure maybe m most people here have heard of IoT, right? Or at least tried it perhaps also as well. So why should you care about IoT? That's one question that many people ask. That's, many people haven't heard about the term IoT, Internet of Things. That's surprising actually because this are some real facts. An equity group uh, and on a recent survey said that 87% of, pe of people have never heard of IoT. And that's crazy because it's becoming a trending term in our communities. Even if we're not aware of it, we're actually using it. And according to Bain and Company, a research another research group, it's already exceeding one four hundred seventy billion dollars in revenue for IoT vendors by 2020. It's it's crazy. It's already that's a predicted thing. It's it's true. It's going to be that big of a revenue for vendors who deal with IoT based technology. Another thing is that. 30.7 billion devices will be available by 2020, IoT devices. So basically, you can see that it's everywhere basically these days, and it's basically a principle of everything connected. You can see these devices all around you. You use it, you wear them, you can see wearables like that, like, the ther like now a smart thermostat, maybe you're already using it these days, or even on your refrigerator perhaps. Now we have, for example, smart automation, as you can see over here perhaps, or also smart refrigerators where you can connect to the internet. And as you, uh, and as you also know on some situations, maybe you also already know that these refrigerators have smart inventory systems so they can track on what you're missing in the refrigerator, how full it is, and other stuff like that. So the potential of IoT is really diverse within the field. And today I'm gonna be talking about specifically about the two kinds of situations. Consumer-based applications and industry-based applications. And I'm going to be showing a demo for each one. And these are going to be based on taking data from the cloud and uploading data to the cloud. Now, I expect that most of you must be familiar with Azure from Microsoft probably, right? The service. 
uh, or perhaps people can also use Amazon Web Services perhaps if you've already used it per, uh, to store data. Maybe you've already also used Bluemix from IBM or other cloud-based services. Another thing is Google Always Free. Maybe you've already heard of that as well. And basically that's a lot of this cloud service that are only available at this time. But for today, we're going to be focusing on Azure services. And maybe you've already used these services since if you've already used the, the Azure. You know IoT Hub, Jobstream, IoT Suite, Storage. So I'm not going to be going over the definitions of those uh, for this time. I'm going to be focusing on the applications of those device, uh, these services. And in collecting data into the cloud, basically it's going to be based on three main steps. Sensing the data, analyzing, and mitigation. These are the three important properties of being able to measure the data. You first sense it, and that's the thing. We use different sensors uh, to measure the data. The, uh, actually, today, for today, I'm going to be showing um, an application through one of my sensors, which is through the Raspberry Pi. Maybe you've already heard of that. It's this little device over here. I have a DHT11 module attached to it. So it's a temperature, it's a little temperature monitoring device. And also it can also measure humidity and it uploads the data to the cloud. And that's one of the devices that's gonna be uploading the data today. So uh, after that, you can analyze the data and that's what makes Azure really great because we are able to upload the data to Azure and we can analyze it through the analytics they have in that way because they are all stored in the storage systems that they have and we can further process the data since they can we can sort it through many different features that it has. We can do many other things with the data as well after that through many other services that we may be using. Eventually comes to the, we come to the last step, the mitigation property which is when we finally take action against what is already coming up and after anal analyzing data. Because for example, if we're already in this area, we're putting device in uh, different areas, we can see if one area is particularly dangerous, for example, uh, if it's giving bad threshold data. And that's also one feature that Azure has, which I'm gonna show also later. We can specify a threshold value and it can send alerts to your phone. Uh, which, uh, which is very great because we don't want to monitor everything constantly every day, right? We don't want to spend 24-7 at one area, monitoring one area. We want smart notifications. We want those kinds of things that can happen to our phone. They can just directly give the messages to our phone and we can get the data that much smarter that way. And this, uh, as, and this one architecture example that I was talking about, so we use basically the Raspberry Pi as the middleware. And uh, as you can see over there, that's an example of uh, the sensor that I was talking about. This uh, just one sensor. And we use it, uh, the Raspberry Pi as the intermediary to connect the sensor to the cloud. And eventually have Azure services so that we are able to process the data. And we are able to get all that data to be read in Windows services, for example, the main computer, because usually all those cloud services that are, that are already into the cloud are being controlled by one main service. For example, one com main computer, which is the mainframe of everything. And usually we can get all that data and start mitigating that way. Microsoft has sim a similar model as this one, but I prefer to call this the leaked box model. We, the locked box model. We have the database, which is where all the data is stored. And sometimes I put this lock over here because sometimes we can ac actually encrypt that model. We can, we can encrypt our database. But for today's examples, it's not going to be based on encryption because I just want to access the data easily. So uh, these are going to be based on unsecured networks. And I'm going to be talking about that a little bit more after this. And we have an API service, perhaps, that can be used as well for the intermediary between the measurement sensors and the uh, and basically the, ser the cloud service. And we may have associated protocols that we may use within the measuring through the API service. And we eventually have the message that's being sent. This message may contain notifications as well that can come from the database into our own dev devices that can eventually help us to know when something is wrong or not. And 
eventually we have the final tier over there, the back end. Now, just a bit more about MQTT. Now, this is one protocol that I'm going to be using in my examples today. We see that there's a publisher over here, and there's a sensor, and eventually this all is transmitted through MQTT, which eventually ends up going to the subscriber, and also a pr pr probably a main computer, as I was talking about earlier. So, the, but the main two things you have to focus on today is the publisher and the subscriber, because we are able to have one, one subscriber and one publisher, and that's the important thing. We want to be able to publish the data that we have and that from the cloud, perhaps, and we have one device that's subscribing to that data and retrieve that data for us to access. Now, this is one example of SQL. I'm not going to be talking about SQL much because we're going to be talking more about Azure storage based, but it can also contain SQL, so I'm just going to be talking a bit about SQL. It is also one feasible service to be able to store the data, and we can see over here that there are some events. As you can see over here, for example, uh, there is the we can declare the public event over here, and we can eventually get the get the name of the data, and we can have the the value name over here, as you can see over here, and we can return that <coughs> value according to our measurement, for example, in the cloud, and basically it iterates over there and we have an on property change uh, calling method that is one method that is important to note because we are able to change the property that way and we're able to retrieve the value and take mitigations that way and these are some other some other coding as you can see over here we can declare a new partial class for example and we can create the async method of connection for SQLite and we have over here, we declare the <coughs> connection, we declare dependency service, and we have basically get the SQL again, module again over here. And finally, we have the variable sensors. We await the connection, we get the new observable collection so that we are able to get the sensor data over here, and finally we are able to Get the, 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 the get the sensors to equal to the item source and basically put them in a list view as most lists usually do because we usually s display those kinds of sen uh, retrieval data into lists that we can access. And somewhere over here, we can see that we have uh, uh, we declare a new variable sensor. For example, if we want to put a new sensor, we another wait another connection. We also we can also see that we can declare if what's going on if we keep the data ongoing and what if it does complete because we want to keep looping the data over and over again. We want to keep the retrieval method going uh, on and on again. And just one note to uh, before I continue on, I'm not going to be going uh, back and forth to Visual Studio and back to my presentation again for this presentation because it may take time. I'm just going to be focusing on showing code snippets that I believe are crucial to being able to understand the basic IoT. So basically, I'm going to be showing the code snippets that are necessary for IoT connections. And this is the publisher for our example, as I told you before. This is the Raspberry Pi. We're going to be using Raspberry Pi for as the publisher. And actually, uh, for uh, and as I said, we're going to be using the MQTT method of transmitting the protocol. And it's a very, it's a very great device. Uh, many, many of you may have heard of also, for example, Arduino or the Intel Galileo. And those are p possible microcontrollers as well that can, you can use as the intermediary to connect your sensors with, to keep sending the data towards your cloud service. And that's, uh, that's, so that's a choice. You can use Raspberry Pi or you can use any other microcontrollers as well. And this is just one example that you can do to simulate data yourself. Uh, and act this is actually a coding based on Python, but this is just to be able to make a publisher to, to later retrieve the data through Xamarin. We can see we do define, define how we initialize the data, and eventually we create random, random, random uniform new, random dot uniform new uh, data. So this is basically coding for declaring 
taking a random variable between this number and this number. And because we want to, for example, if we don't have the sensor yet, we, we can use this kinds of code to be able to try it out ourselves. We can declare this to be able to have the service generate a, new, a random number for us, and it can go into our readings later. And this is just a simulator-based kind of method. Now, I'm going to be talking a bit about smarter analytics. And this is important because we want to be able to analyze our data in a smart way. We want to be able to get the data in the cloud and have the right analysis patterns in order to mitigate our options. And this involves sending notifications, having better services. So, and this is one example of what I'm going to talk about next. We have the rules engine in the, the cloud-based server. We can, we can see that the rules-based engine can connect many devices at once, uh, many services and devices at once. For example, we want to connect a smart air purifier, and the notif we can send a notification through the rules engine from the, uh, the, uh, the no rules engine uh, to the user's phone. Or also, we can basically detect the, the exhaust of emissions, and we can also make other mitigation strategies to be able to take these devices from the rules engine. And in IoT Suit, one of Azure's div, uh, services, we are able to see all these in action because they have commands that are able to be put out. For example, if we want to set an alarm for a th specific threshold being surpassed, or if we want to get a notification based on someone sending a command directly through Azure to our device, we are able to see that through the rules engine that Azure offers. And this is an example of an IoT hub measurement in Azure, just to get a good picture of what it's like. We can see the messages that's going on here, we can see device connected, and you probably already are used to these kinds of things if you're already used to IoT Hub. And this is an example of my collection of data, which happened over time. We can see over here that each of these data are assigned to a specific uh, key code. We can see over here the specific key codes that everyone has. And for example, this one, I put a sample that takes the data every small periods of intervals, and we're able to see the duration that, ha that it happened, and we are able to see all the data over here, and if we actually click on one of those, we are able to see the, no the details wi which happened, and you can see over here the message received, we can see that it happened, and that's about it. And now I'm going to be talking a bit about the example process of the being able to send data to the IoT Hub and to control data. This is going to be, uh, after uh, this short coding slides, I'm going to be showing a bit of example uh, demo based on my own kind of exp implementation on Azure and based on being able to retrieve that data and being able to send commands to the data. So this is an example of deserializing JSON. We're able to see uh, we have we are able to see deserializing uh, the JSON over here since we are usually sending messages over to our device and sometimes because that's in JSON we have to s interpret it into string and that's what we do. We, we are able to deserialize, the, uh, deserialize the, the messages that happen so that we are able to retrieve the, the messages that are incoming and we can see over here that we encode it and we eventually parse it to be able to read it by text, the, the messages that happen. It can be in the form of notifications, for example. <coughs> and also, we create a new variable for a new message to be able to serialize that data. We're and we finally await the device client to eventually send data to our device once more. We are able to send the event that happened to our, devi to our device, or we can also send it back. Now, th these are actually some very important concepts of being able to retrieve the, the data from the device. Each kind of device has to have these codes. These, uh, because usually, for example, if I, since I'm using IoT Suit, they specifically ask for device key and host name. And those are some things that we have to get. So that th those are something that I specify. We can see over here that I get and set the device, the device key over here and the host name so that we are able to retrieve the data 
which is happening from the IoT suit into our application in Xamarin. We then have, a need, I also then <coughs> specify how we can send that data. We, for example, we I also want to send it through a frequency of uh, 1,000 1, milliseconds, so that's one thing that I specified here. And we finally specify uh, how we want to connect the data. We, if we, w if how we are able to get the connection, and we, that's why we created variable is connected. And this is just one example of how we are able to create an event handler <coughs> to be able to retrieve the data. We create a notification that we have received the data, and we basically create keep on it, keep it going, and how it continues the data overall that way. And this basically event handler to handle the messages received by the, the data. And here are some more de definitions. We are setting the settings of the connection. We can see over here how we add or add or update the value of each kind of variable. B these are done through the device ID and also the device key. And basically each of these need to have how we update the data. And that's basically how we are able to retrieve the data that way. We are specifying through each of these connection strings that we are going to be retrieving the data through the, a compilation of them, basically. So we're able to get the value that is already being extracted from each of the different variables that are already here. And it's important for us to be able to retrieve data from each connection string to be able to get them all combined that way. And also, this I'm going to be showing how to create a command in Azure. We have actually, I'm going to show you, you all also later about con connecting to a commanding, sending a command through Azure. This is an example of being able to start a new command. I you can see I did a while loop here to be able to keep it going if the switch is already going on. And we can see over here that, that I am specifying the variable message and the coding over here specifies the general commands that I am putting over there. We can see basically the name, the message ID, the created, the time it is created, and finally the parameters that it is reporting on. And these are all they, these are all important components of what we're going to send as a message. We're going to send. The, me the message name, the, the key, and basically all of that, because we, we want you usually want to know what we're being notified about. For example, we're being notified about if there is an emergency alert. That's going to be shown in the title if we're specifying it through this way. And if we're seeing the message ID, maybe some people are interested also in knowing those kinds of IDs. So that's also another thing. And finally, of course, the most important thing is the message the way that's coming through. And we can see that we are interpreting that through JSON to two strings. So we can see that all coming through. And that's just uh, one example. And we finally add the new values that are being already transmitted over there. And we can see these are some typical device settings. And these are actually connected to the command that I already mentioned before. We are specifying the types of device, the, the types of data that we are going to send to Azure to measure or to command. For example, I am putting on temperature data and humidity and voltage, for example. And these are all through the variable at measurement. And I can see that I am adding a new measurement. So each time we are announcing something like this, we basically just put it there, and we basically just put it a new one over a new line of, of the, these kinds of variables, which is connected to the previously uh, mentioned command kind of coding. So we are able to get the data, and we are able to see that data in IoT Hub when we try to measure it, and when we try to command it in I IoT suit. Sorry, IoT suit, and we eventually we we add a new command. Previously, we were just specifying the details of a new command, but now we are adding a new command <coughs> so that we are able to get a new alert, for example. For example, I put a new command called trigger alarm, and now the par I, can set, uh, I can put the parameters over here, and I'm just using a usual collection kind of method to be able to, com uh, put, put to, be to call the command module, and 
I'm putting new I'm putting the basic variables of what I was already specifying I'm just putting the name the type and I'm specifying it as string so that it'll be parsed as a string and we are, we can see over here that we are receiving the message this way we're calling it and these are some basic pra parameters that I was mentioning before B remember when I said the get set method that was previously already available we are, are now declaring for the get set method for being able to retrieve that data and these are for example these are for example my device ID my host name and my device key and through that get set method we're able to get that retrieve that data and we're able to direct them to try to read the data using these spe specified variables we already declared these variables so now we are putting in what are supposed to be in that field and these are some notifications from Azure if we want to get notified we can see some of the coding over here we can see for example this is the continuation of the previous alert text we can see over here how we want to receive the message and we can see how we want to invoke the kind of method because we because usually when we command some sort of data we want to put as an invoke method and we can display it as an alert for example I want to display it as a notification from Azure IoT suit and we can finally just click something for example I put close so we can close the notification on our phone and this is one example of how to be able to declare kind of notifications when we receive them from Azure and how we can interpret them into our phone now the possibilities of location services actually before I went to Samarin we were already experimenting on this stuff as well but eventually we, when we went to Samarin we started to also experiment on a lot of geolocation devices this is an example of what we were experimenting on as well in the Grace to you we were trying to put on like for example little marks on where devices are maybe you can see those little blue dots that I put around the map and basically when we select one of them we want just the user to be able to see these kinds of variables for example a measurement we can see over here it's kind of small but it's reading like a particle of matter CO2 CO and we basically want to be uh, our users to be able to sense all those data and access it easily that way and that's why we started to use the geolocation service that Azure offers because it seemed to be a good choice and that's what I'm going to be talking about next as well because as you can see if we're using many devices at the same time we need to be able to measure the devices in correctly right because we, we need to be able to access devices easily uh, to be able to see how each area is doing especially if we're measuring dangerous areas at the same time so this is a very important aspect of uh, Samarin I believe because we were able to measure the geolocation services that's already available and we are able to make it u make use of it for our further analytical processing and to analyze our data better this is just one example of some variables that they uh, provide us with in Samarin we for example we used the cross geolocator to be able to cross examine one location and we finally just maybe we can declare it as locator and we can uh, put in desired accuracy if we for example want it to be in one specific area or we want to be in another and we can make a new variable for example position to be able to await that measurement to be able to we and we can finally retrieve it you can see over here how we are able to retrieve the latitude and the longitude and we can see over here how we are able to declare that all and basically from here we are able to get the data and it will be transported into, for example, our IoT suit device. And this is just another optional thing that you may consider for notifications. Now, some people may not like notifications to their phone. They may be wanting something more, for example, when, for example, they want to get mail instead, email, or they want other methods. But usually, most people want email. Of course, not too much spam email, of course, or, or the, the person will get overwhelmed. So this is just one example of the architecture to be able to set up this kind of service. We, ha we can just declare the address, display name subject, and we can eventually create the address. And of course, we add no more keys again in regards to how uh, the, the details of the user in IoT suit 
or in IoT Hub or in the other services that may be holding these kinds of keys. So we are, we are able to access the cloud service and send it from there. Now, I'm going to be showing a bit of an app demo, as I was mentioning before. This is an example of uh, an application that lets you send data over to the Azure IoT services. We're able to see, uh, I named it to Thermotrial app. Now, from what I already previously said, these are all the important components of being able to connect with the data. And I'm not be going to be explaining about the layout data because that's probably already simple. We just have to link it. You can already see I declared, for example, things like a button, slider, and that's not something too big to handle. So you can see over here how we connect with the IoT suit services. We can just press this in. And eventually when we start that, we already are creating a connection string between our app and Xamarin. So, uh, our, sorry, our app and Azure. So after that, we, we are already connected with the services. We can play around with sliders a bit, and we can finally start to control the thermostat data by able, this is just a sample application. For example, I'm trying to simulate, a, for example, controlling a thermostat. So we can s just click this, controlling thermostat data, and we just basically have to wait for a bit. And as you can see over here, we have some readings coming out. You can see that there are some readings over here. And we can play around with a bit to see how IoT Suite will interpret it. And as you can see, there are more spikes. So this is not the retrieving data part yet. This is just an example of being able to control device in a smart home. This is not connected to a real thermostat, but we're able to see the potential through this kind of application into Azure services. We're able to control a dev uh, our device through Azure services, and all we need to actually do is link it to Azure, and we can use Xamarin to be able to control the coding needed to be able to control the measurements from anywhere we like. And that's just one thing that we can do with Azure for now. And I'm going to be moving on to the next. As we can see, this is already working with, also we can see the voltage over here. And we can see the max, max, maximum humidity, minimum humidity. And th those are just some factors that can be considered. And also, we can actually as I was mentioning before, we can send a command. We can open our device, open commands. And as I mentioned before, we may have a trigger our method when. And let's just use the old text that all programmers learn at the first time. Hello world. And as you can see, sure enough, we have the message from Azure IoT Suite, hello world. So those are the FX from what I've already mentioned before. We are declaring the commands, the variables, and we've already created that to be able to retrieve the data from the uh, our device. And we can see over there, we, as we mentioned before, we can just click OK, and that'll be that. So now moving back into our PowerPoint. Of course, w uh, as I mentioned before, we may have some network considerations, of course, when we are implementing these kinds of systems, uh, which will apply also to the industrial-based application, which I'll talk about later as well. For example, like the frequency of data requests, how often we are requesting the data, because sometimes we may request the data too often, which can consume ma much of our bandwidth, which is the next thing we should consider, how often we are requesting it, and that's very important, So, because if we're not, our data can run out, or maybe we just don't need data that much. But for emergency situations, for example, for situations that need 
quick mitigation that may be necessary. <laughs> and of course, the network options that we're using, we may be using different kinds of networks. Maybe you're using Zigbee or maybe you're using Wi-Fi. Those are some considerations to use when you're considering to implement these kinds of applications. And uh, QoS, basically. You may know, uh, basically, from QoS that you, you need a, a feedback if the, it's already received or you don't need feedback at all. And that's just one thing that we need to consider when we're implementing these kinds of solutions. And of course, we do have similar services. Now, you, uh, for smart home services, such as I mentioned, with, uh, which I mentioned before, which the, with the Thermostat Simulator app, we may, you may have heard of HomeKit, which is something that I've also recently heard from, uh, which I've also recently been playing about with for a while. I'm not going to be talking about it here because it's already available on uh, the Microsoft website, so you can already play around with it a bit for a while. But it, we can see a lot of potential in Xamarin for the, the smart homes because with the home kit, for example, you're able to control many new devices through Xamarin and they already provide a full platform for that, so that's one thing that you may be interested in looking at, at uh, also. And also, I've been noticing that now Xamarin has the IoT console application. I, have been, I haven't been playing about with it much yet, but that's also one thing to consider looking at as well. And of course, uh, I mentioned I was talk gonna talk about security soon, and sure enough, as I mentioned before, I disabled the security communication protocols for these examples. So you may consider enabling it because sometimes in the IoT Hub, there is a secure, secure network connection. I had to disable it because I wanted to do it directly and easily to be able to access it. But you may consider to add new measurements to that. For example, you can enable the IoT Hub services or the storage-based encryption services to be able to monitor the data securely to people cannot just get in whenever they want. And also, this is a new method that's be seen, been recently brought to my attention. Uh, the X0509 certificate. This is one of the examples of certificates that you can put in for, to, for the <coughs> application to cross-check. You can find actually more talks about this. I'm not going to be talking going much about this, but there are a lot of people going on about this in the Microsoft websites as a general. So that's one thing to consider. And of course, as I mentioned before, security from the IT app and the storage as well. And now I'm going to be talking about the user-based, uh, consumer-based application that uh, the industrial-based application that people may be wondering about. Now, the retrieving of the data is important for us. And that's why we have these kinds of diagrams. We start from the user. They may start from their own account, for example, from Azure services, then, or for example, other services, or they, they, and then they may finally take it from table storage. Now, this is a feature available in Azure. There are many types of storages available, blob storage and other types of storages. But for this one, I'm going to be using table storage because it stores data as a table. And that's what we need for this example. And Finally, we have services, which is the needed example for this one. We want to be able to uh, get the services going. We need to get the mitigation properties going for this one. And I'm going to talk a bit more about code before I get to the next demo. We, we are defining a cloud storage account, as we can see here. We, it, and this thing uh, requires the Azure storage plugin, which is available in most Xamarin which is available in all Xamarin kind of uh, Visual Studio or Xamarin Studio. And you can just basically download this and as a new get package. And we can see over here that I'm declaring a new public class for a table entity. And we're basically trying to determine the location and the position that it, the data is being taken at. And this is one of the geolocation services that I was mentioning about earlier as well. And you can see that we are trying to make the, the position of the data visible when we click on a button. And that's important because we want to be able to retrieve the data not that easily. We want to be able to read the data when <coughs> it's actually being pressed and not just it keeps on going. And that's one important thing that we may consider. And we have the cloud table client over here. We are trying to create a new cloud table to be able to retrieve the data. and we are able to then get the reference for that from the table. And that gets it from the Azure basically. 
and we finally query the table to be able to retrieve the data into our mobile phones, for example, and basically to the services that we want them, the data to go into. And this is why we have the table query kind of method. And we also declare the position entity to be able to do find the geolocation of the data. So we are able to see where the data is taken at, as I mentioned before. And finally, we are adding new items over here. As you can see, we, we uh, every time we iterate over each data, we are adding new items. We are basically adding new measurements, new, new items to the list, as I may say, because we are putting in this kind of format. We want the entity and the time uh, entity timestamp, and we add that with the entity message, which may be taken from each data. And this is the two variables that we are focusing on when we're taking the data from what we are already doing. So for this one, I'm actually going to be showing the industrial scenario. And to do this, I'm going to be switching laptops for a bit because it's on the other laptop. No, it's still needed. Okay, as you can see over here, this is one basic algorithm of what I've done. So this example, we're already connected to the internet, and we can just click on this button, and we can see data over here. We can see all the data stored in the table over here. We can see that recently data was stored at 9.50 a.m. Since I'm not turning on the Raspberry Pi right now, we're not getting the live data, but recent data was collected at 9.50 a.m. And you can see this going over seven intervals. We can see it all going over here. And as I mentioned before, the two specified time periods are already received over here. We can see we are retrieving uh, our time. We're retrieving when the date, uh, the date of the, when it's already being gotten at. So that's one important thing that we, w we need to understand from Azure, and we can use this to build our own solutions as well. Now, finally, I'm going to be showing one more demo of a bigger scale implementation of that. And I'm just going to be showing that directly on another Android emulator. We can see this This uh, actually one thing that uh, Grace Studio has already been working on, this uh, real-life implementation of what we've already implemented within some of our consumers. We actually used the previous set methods from Samarin to be able to build this kinds of data uh, application on a .NET based <coughs> backend. And we're able to see each of the data being retrieved and basically more kinds of graphs based on what the sensor is doing. We can see over here, we can scroll down and we can see lots of measurements that we're already taking in. And basically you can see here a whole list of data, a whole, the results of what we're go going getting at and basically each individual data over here, the last measurement of data, and we can see the timestamp of when the data was received over here. So we can see that there's a lot of potential within this area and the potential that Samarin provides for it because we're able to get all that data and be able to use that data for many purposes because we want smart analytics. We want to be able to mitigate our data much smarter before because in what people have researched, of course, using these kinds of services, using and uh, using customized data processing that are processed by computers, we're able to take mitigations and actions based on data much faster than if we do it based on our own kind of analysis. So that's the last demo. And
Just a recap of everything I've talked about so far. We can see that building IoT-based apps on Xamarin is actually simple, simpler than most people think. It may be sometimes an uh, intimidating concept when we connect, to the, uh, connect apps to the internet, con make, connect, make connected apps to the internet. It's not so hard, actually. We just have to be able to know what we need to do. We need to know the principles of what we need to do and, and the method, methods that are mentioned before, the important connection methods to link our device with the cloud because the interfacing of the device is simple. The hard part will come, of course, when we're trying to connect the Azure with the device that we already have, but as long as we know the correct methods, that should be a piece of cake. And we can see that generally the equation is when we have Xamarin-based IoT apps, we have more productivity. We can save our time, save our lives that way, and basically that helps us all in the long term. We can have much more important IoT applications. And as I mentioned before in one of my beginning slides, IoT is an important thing that we are go is going to revolutionize the world at some point. So that's a very important thing to consider. And we should start uh, getting more implementations into, from Xamarin into IoT. And of course, it creates comfortability. We're saving time that way. We're emphasizing user experience based on what we are doing with IoT. We, we, we can actually, this is an example of one of the first designs that um, Grass Studio was working on at the first time. We actually started out by designing an application based on when you click one kind of device, it actually, it actually tells you below there if it's functioning or one device if it's under maintenance. And when we click one of the devices, it will then give out the data that we need. For example, as I mentioned before, temperature, humidity, pressure, or altitude, and that's the data that we want. And that's how we are able to retrieve it through our phones. And for example, that can be based on the .NET backend or other backends that you may set up by, uh, for yourself. So that's just one example of what we've been working on as well and implementing Xamarin. So we, that's a big application area. And we can see that this is a simplistic design. We don't have to tell our users to go through do this to connect to this method, do that to connect to that method. We can just simply tell them to connect, uh, put in their connection string and they can simply f uh, just access all the data. And that's what's important about Xamarin apps. We need to emphasize the simplicity of our methods of design for users, especially with the simplistic interface that we need to design as well for the complex IoT apps that we may have eventually and the coding that we may have. And of course, we can control our big data wisely. We can control it because we are able to control much data, many data at once instead of just reading it one by one and deciding based on that. And finally, I would like to encourage future explorations of IoT here because I'm sure that many of you are already quite far in your uh, app implementations with Xamarin. So it would be great to have more implementations out there in in the world about IoT based implementations and I'm always happy to be able to see new implementations of what people are doing and how we are be a able to use IoT to uh, Xamarin to further the IoT cause because as I've also seen already on Microsoft Networks now we have for example you may have already seen on the last Xamarin Evolve um, 2016 conference, they had a Mind Drive app. I thought that that was a really cool app. Maybe you've already seen that app as well. They will also now have a pacemaker. Uh, they also have a pace measure. So now you are already able to detect how how uh, how long have you traveled and basically the distance you have traveled. So that's very. Th those are very interesting implementations in IoT, and that's what I've been keeping a lot of tabs on. So that that all that is very interesting to look at and I encourage more uh, you all to look at more implementations in IoT and also put in your own implementations based on well, perhaps w some of the methods that I have already mentioned before. And that's the end of my presentation. Are there any questions? Yes? Uh, question for you. Mostly you are using Raspberry Pi. Is it like the OS with Raspberry or are they using the Windows 10 IoT? I'm and used... What's the benefit? Then why <laughs> okay. Actually, um, I had a long history of experimenting with station with the Raspberry Pi. Actually, the benefit is that 
it's actually um, it doesn't consume too much power and it's simple. It, its interface is simple. Uh, we, we can just uh, we can be the, the basic backend code that I created in Raspberry Pi was based in Python, so uh, that was actually quite simple. Uh, and another thing that it's com uh, I found con the connection with MQTT with the Raspberry Pi very compatible, so I really liked how it was sending a very uh, low bandwidth signals. And also, other than that, it just provides as a good platform. It can be just brought anywhere and set up anywhere, and it's very simple to connect with the uh, I IoT Hub as a general. I haven't actually played it around with the uh, Windows IoT um, I IoT as, uh, 10 as you mentioned before, so I'm not. I can't comment on that much. Thank you. Any yes? Uh, I find it very interesting. How, how do you upload data from your remote sensor to all this network? Ah uh, yes. Can you repeat? Please? Yes. So um, it's actually uh, they basically. Uh, I didn't put the code there, but actually it's based on Python. <laughs> That's why I didn't <laughs> mention it much because it's uh, Xamarin based. Uh, but uh, from the Python coding, I basically created a library uh, for being able to connect to the Azure IoT Hub. Uh, there are actually uh, this is not actually the focus, but uh, you can also actually also find many libraries that are connected to that. Uh, basically, in uh, the Raspberry Pi, you have to just run a default library. I think that um, aside from the library I've already created myself, there are also libraries re uh, released from um, I think Microsoft to be able to connect with the Azure receipt from Raspberry Pi. So you can just you can just run the library to upload data, and after that you can just implement the methods mentioned before to retrieve the data. This, this is the way. Thank you. Any other questions? Is there any, you talked about the home kit. Yes. Is there anything in the health space that's being worked on by the community or by Microsoft specifically, or any direction relative to what they're doing with health policy? Mm, so far, I don't think I've seen much about that as, as well. Uh, I've only seen uh, they do things like smart lighting or uh, smart uh, turning on uh, thermostat stuff like that. But I haven't seen too much healthcare. I think I, I, I think I haven't seen much developments in healthcare yet. Thank you. Yes? For India, I said that you monitor like a pollution, CO2, uh, CO2, etc. So yes. how do you upload that? Do like you put a DSM? So uh, I assume that uh, you find the report outside somewhere near the road? That's true. That's yeah, correct. Then after that, you monitor 24 hours, then you put DSM or you put a, a asynchronous. Um, we would put an asynchronous method on that one. So basically, um, our uh, we we use the similar library as I mentioned before to your your question. Uh, we we are able to use a customized library to be able to send the data over, and basically that's already programmed into our device. Actually, the uh, the de device that was measuring all the kinds of pollutants that you saw, CO two CO, was actually uh, an Arduino. We we did it based on Arduino, and that was an an example, we, we created a library to be able to measure it. Uh, it's, b it's based on uh, the Arduino IDE language. So that, yeah, we created that library and we hence the run the, when it ran the library, we put it just, uh, we programmed our device to be able to retrieve that data uh, to, to the sensor that already attached to it. We put it in a space and it'll just retrie keep retrieving the data that way. And we just have to create a backend and retrieve the data from there. Yes. Thank you. So, yes. Uh, just now when you are showing this, uh, the environment running all your iTunes stuff, right? Yes. So, um, for what the data you have uh, consolidated, right? Yes. How much does it, I mean, cost per month for Azure using the Azure services? Because I'm right now using open source and stuff like that. I haven't started moving stuff to the cloud because everything is running all locally in my home and stuff like that. So, if you ship all these things to the cloud platform, how much roughly does it cost in the range? I mean, to do something like uh, all this stuff. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good question. So uh, actually, um, we haven't really. Uh, we actually uh, are not too old with Azure yet. We you actually uh, recently. Uh, we actually uh, are just um, experimenting with Azure, uh, our company. So we are actually uh, mostly still using the free free trial services that company is offered. So I can't really comment on yeah, the. For the free trial, you should have a roughly gauge of how much does it cost, right? 
I think I can safely assume that for using be, because most of the consum uh, the consumption of the data is from Azure IoT suit. That's the biggest consumer of data, I'd say. And bec because without the suit, I think it you can uh, be actually consume data as slow as I think uh, two dollars per day. But when you put in the IoT suit, it can actually go to like. 30 or 40, so <laughs> so that's just one uh, consideration. Uh, I think that's just, uh, but, but that's just the option of the user because when you put the IoT suit, uh, uh, they put a lot of services into what you're doing. So, um, but you can also minimize the cost by uh, disabling some of the services and I also see, yes. minimizing, yes, that's correct. So it varies really with each user depending on what they want to do, if they want to, uh, for example, put many devices at once, that'll consume a lot of data, So, but if they want to put one at uh, one device at once, I would safely assume that it wouldn't consume that much. Because I'm uh, one of my, impl uh, my implementation is actually monitoring a lot of data at once, so I think that's what caused a lot of the data consumption. So yeah, it varies, it depends on the needs of each user. Okay, thank you. Oh, what I was talking about was based on the Azure website, the no, no, IoT suit. Another one, right? Another website, the one that you show, Azure website. Uh, the, the one on the Azure that you build your .NET stuff, web apps. Right? Oh, web apps. Yeah. Um, we're based, uh, what I did, that one was that I did it locally. I hosted locally, so it hasn't oh, incurred okay. any costs yet. Yeah, th because there I, w I was just doing this for a sample. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So, any other questions? Uh, yes? I just want to add on that one. If you want to, uh, I don't know if you know there is an Azure pricing tool uh, where you can go and you can select the, depending on your requirement, how many functions are you going to use, and how many requests you're going to send, and this year. Depending on it, will give you an estimated cost and how much it's going to cost you. Assumption not real, but it's going to be better. Uh, so that is uh, I have one question for you. Uh, I have one question. Uh, so th this is great stuff for when you want to connect it to, uh, to like all suite of this. Uh, but as for example, if you want to connect it to multiple uh, form factor devices, not just one Adreno. Uh, I understand if you are using Adreno or you do it, uh, either you can do it Adreno or either you can do it in then LED or in other stuff. But I'm talking about if you want to do it whole suite of, uh, if you want to open an endpoint of the data from a different suite of applications like HomeKit or even the, the Philips or, or, or uh, Nest or a uh, few other stuff like, uh, for example, health devices, home ROM and stuff like that. Uh, my question is, have you found any way of, of cross-platform implementation which can support different kinds of devices, cost factors, or you have to do it each and individually, but one by one? So uh, you're asking how uh, if uh, one device can go to like a lot of storage devices at once, or uh, you, if you want to uh, open a open, uh, data book point from multiple devices, not just one like a printer, but also from uh, from different uh, like you can from Apple Cake or uh, devices from Philips or from uh, from healthcare home loans or. At this time, our experimentation is based on Azure has not really reached a kind of like cross-platform yet. We've been basically implementing one by one because uh, so far uh, we've been implementing uh, for like each device has a we, we, we put in the connection string for each device specifically into uh, from Azure into each device. So uh, I would uh, I can't really comment either on being able to comment uh, on putting cross platform uh, that way. But I think that um, there should be something like that. I think. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions before we wrap up? 
Okay, so uh, I'd like to conclude with one final message once more. I would like to encourage all of you Samarin programmers to be able to develop IoT applications and based on um, what some stuff that I mentioned and I'm look forward to a lot of your implementations as well based on what if you already put on for example if you contribute to Microsoft or if you put in new kinds of services so all again I'd say I'd like to say thank you for being here and enjoy the rest of your day at Sam uh, at Monkey Fest <laughs>